You've changed, Rupert Baggins. You're not the same hobbit as the one who left the Shire. I was going to tell you. I... found something in the Goblin Tunnels. Found what? What did you find? My carriage. Good. Well, that's good. A clip from, obviously, I mean, do I need to back announce it? I probably do. Uh, the Hobbit, The Desolation of Smaug. Martin Freeman is here and he's with us. Well, he's in a posh hotel and I'm in the studio. Hello, Martin. Hello, Simon. Oh, you've changed so much there. I know. You're quite at home in that posh hotel, aren't you? It's pretty hard to get me out. <laughs> you need a tin opener. Uh, had a fantastic time watching The Desolation of Smaug, which when I went in, oh. it was The Desolation of Smaug. And then well. only halfway through realised I'd been saying it wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I think everyone's having that. They're having sort of um, having to retroactively pronounce it differently all their lives. Because I think everyone came into it thinking it was smog. But yes, it's it has been decreed officially. Yeah, and then I had, a, I, had a, I had a pronunciation lesson from Stephen Fry. It was on my Radio 2 show a few days ago. And he said, oh, really? he said no, no, it's definitely smog. So it's definitely go. smog. Although sometimes Peter Jackson, he, he puts a little shh in there for some reason. He calls him smog. He goes oh. all kind of connery on it. I don't really know why. The desolation um, of Schmaug. Yeah. So if it's you're going to be pure sexier. to the way Peter Jackson <laughs> yeah, wants yeah, yeah, it yeah. to be, yeah. that's it's the not way small it is. Uh, anyway, so take us, um, uh, just take us through a little bit of the adventure uh, mm. that, that, that we see you take part in here for, for the desolation here. Just uh, just give us some of the story arc, as you guys say. Well, we are, you know, we're further into the journey. The journey is, for those who don't know, the dwarves are trying to get back to Erebor to retrieve their lost kingdom and their lost treasure. And I've been kind of uh, not exactly press ganged, but I've gone along for this uh, for this ride. Why I know not really at this stage. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I'm a bit of a, a a loose cannon, and I don't really know why they want me. But apparently they want me to burgle something at the other side. So you join us right in the midst of uh, the trials and tribulations of of being on the road and facing lots of dangerous foes and being chased by orcs. Um, and we encounter spiders and elves, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Bilbo proves himself to be more than helpful on several occasions. In the fact, he p- proves himself to be totally invaluable, actually. The great thing about having orcs as your number one enemy is they're very easy to kill, and dwarves <laughs> are fantastically difficult to harm in any sense. Yeah, it's good that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, good. It's, it's almost as if it's slanted in our favour. It is, it is. Uh, so, but you have, you have the rings, so just, yeah. you know... Explain how that is fitting in and where Gandalf fits in with this bigger hmm. story. Well, Gandalf is kind of uncovering um, a great, yeah, the greater sort of picture is that um, the Dark Lord is uh, rising again, basically, um, and is summoning his forces. The Dark Lord is him. always rising again. That's what Dark Lords do, <laughs> isn't it? In yeah. yeah. Why even bother saying they're rising? You just say <laughs> they're they're rising. Um, and so, yes, basically, I, I don't want to say too much, no. but um, there, is a, there is a darkness in Dol Guldur, for those who know their Tolkien, that, uh, that is coming to the fore, and Gandalf has got to deal with that, while all we're thinking of is getting to this mountain, and what we know is going to be the end of that is um, a dragon called Smaug, um, but even Smaug uh, knows of the greater plan that is afoot. So we're kind of playing the shorter the, or the smaller game, but the smaller game is big enough for us because we're yeah. facing death and danger all the time. And and how has Bilbo changed from what we saw last time? He's. I think it's like the journey from innocence to experience. You know, um, I mean, obviously he has the ring, and as we know, the ring kind of uh, exerts a hold over the person who is carrying it. But if, I think it's not even without the ring, he would have to have changed because he's essentially been at war for however many months he's been out of the Shire. And war changes people. And that experience of having to kill or be killed changes people. And he finds himself in situations in this film where if he doesn't act, then who will? If he doesn't save his and his comrades' lives, then nobody will. So he has to do it. And of course the ring helps it helps him to do that. But I think the impetus comes from the same place, which is loyalty to his friends. When you went back, I understand you, you did some additional shooting over the summer to put in Correct. some extra stuff. 
was that fantastically... In- I mean, I imagine this whole thing, apart from being mm. very hard work, is enormously mm. enjoyable. But to go back knowing mm-hmm. about the success of the last mm. movie must have given you a certain swagger. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. It's, I, I, guess, I guess so. Uh, I think it, it would be hard to know what it would be like if, it, if, it, if the first one had tanked. You know, I, I'm sure if the first one had tanked, it would have been a very different um, six weeks that I'd spent in New Zealand this year. Uh, I think we, we were all quietly confident as we were doing it that it, people would want to see it. I mean, either it's one of those very few things you will ever do in your life when you think, well, whatever it is, people will definitely see this film because there was a hunger to see it and there's already a, a ready-made audience to see it. Um, and they've lapped it up, thank God. But, uh, yeah, I, you, not, I must admit, there's not much swaggering on it because it, you are still working. You, you, it's, it's the job, you know, and, you tr- and the job is immensely fun. But um, I'm honest to God, no one was going, yeah, what about that billion dollars, eh? <laughs> there's, some, there's, there's some great, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how much we can just shout, you know, it, if I'm saying something inappropriate. But clearly okay. you have some scenes with Smaug. Yes, and and clearly do. Smaug does wake up from his, uh, from his position in the Lonely Mountain. Yes. And, and of course, this is, I mean, so there's two things I want to ask you about. First mm-hmm. of all, what was, what's it like to do so much of this mm-hmm. very, very important scene, mm-hmm. but to something that isn't there? Uh-huh. And of course, it's voiced by uh, your Sherlock mate, mm-hmm. Benedict Cumberbatch. So, yeah. th- but, and those scenes are very important. And they w- were, were they really difficult? Um, they're as difficult as uh, that technical aspect of it gets. You know, acting is... Um, it's most fun for me when you're looking in the eyes of the person that you're acting with. You know, if you're able to actually share that space, that's the ideal. But obviously you can't share the space. You know, an actor can't literally be a 400-foot dragon, you know, in terms of um, dimension. So he, even if Ben had been there, I would have been cheating my eye line 40 feet above the ground anyway. Um, but no, it, it becomes more technical. But in a way, it gets more liberating because... in you have to drive the scene, you know, because there is nobody else there to drive it. You're not reacting off anybody, which, as I say, is the fun part of acting. But you are kind of more in the driver's seat, so to speak. I mean, ultimately, of course, Peter Jackson's in the driving seat and it's it's choreographed and yeah. it's very planned. But in terms of tone or nuance and just, you know, out of the 300 versions that you do of it, you know, a lot of that is down to your choice. But there are many, 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 many scenes where people will go and watch this movie and go, Mm. that's why Martin is such a great character here. And they're the scenes where, Mm. the ones that you've just described, they're the ones where actually you you might not have said anything, but you've given us a look, you've raised a finger, and then you've shuffled off. And you go, there you go, (laughs) no one else could do that. That's why, Uh, and that's why Peter Jackson (laughs) wanted you. Thank you. I, I knew there must have been a reason. Yeah. But you must have worked out why now he kind of rearranged everything for you. Because there was some doubt in your mind, I think. But, you know, the, now yeah. you must realize why. Well, you... it's not so much that. It's, it's the same thing as if I, you know, if I said to you, Simon, what makes you such an amazing broadcaster? It, you, you can't, it's not really, it's, you think, well, that's not for me to say. And so when people say, as they have every right to do, why did Peter say you're the only person born to play? It's like, well, I can't. That's not for me to say. I, I think I'm perfectly capable of playing Bilbo. I doubt very much that I'm the only actor out there who could have given you a good Bilbo. You know. Well, I but, think. But yeah, frankly, mine would have been best. Yeah. Yes, I, I, th- I, th- I think we're entirely uh, in agreement. <laughs> I just want to read an email to you uh, mm. from Steve Boniface. It says so far. Yeah, it says, Dear Smaug and Desolation, my girlfriend Jo, having listened to Simon across various BBC radio shows for several years, was until recently completely unaware what he looked like. In fact, in her mind, Simon's voice matched the face of Martin Freeman. Okay. When I showed her a picture on the Five Live website, she refused to believe that the face matched the voice. And really? it wasn't until I showed her a video uh, of the famous Sex and the City 2 rant that she started to believe me. So um, could Simon apologise well. for not looking like <laughs> Martin Freeman? But I think, to be honest, if we were both actors we might well have gone up for the same sort. We're not a million miles from you. It's not like you thought, uh, she thought you looked like me and then you ended up looking like, I don't know, Peter Laurie. Or, or an something. orc. Or an orc, yeah. I mean, we're, we're not, you know, we're both white men with fair hair. How about that? <laughs> we, uh, okay, okay. For, uh, what was, hang on, like, I'm going to break off here. What was the Sex in the City rant? Oh, that was Mark. Uh, that was Mark going. Uh, it was like a half-hour mm-hmm. uh, explosion of rage. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, well, you don't want to be in the way of one of them, do you? And, and did you uh, did you bring away any souvenirs from from Middle Earth? A few coins, a few uh, pairs of ears, uh, some. Oh, I love. Well, a sword of, of, of one of my stings. One of my sting swords. My 
Bilbo's dressing gown that he wears in Bag End, which I wear around the house a lot. It's a beautiful sort of quilted dressing gown. Lovely. Um, But not too much, no, because, you know, some of that stuff is really big, you know. And well, it's going to house won't fit it in it. It's going to be a fantastic few weeks in the Freeman House with uh, mm. not just with Smaug, but with also uh, your other show with Benedict uh, yes. taking a few headlines. Yes. So look out, everybody! It's the year of Martin Freeman. Martin, <laughs> we uh, always enjoy having you on the show. Thank you Thanks, very much. Simon.